Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved fantasy lore, character theme series, and more. Before we dive into today's fourth wing, chapters 11 through 15, we will have our usual content warning. Fantasy Fangirls Podcast is rated R, just like the book fourth wing. This is more like R for gore in this set of chapters, considering multiple people get roasted alive. But regardless, you have been warned. Of course, we will be talking lots of spoilers everything from the entire fourth wing book the iron flame excerpt and our speculations for it and of course anything from rebecca yaros is on the table so if you didn't know that dragons actually can roll their eyes please go listen to the audiobook instead we will be here when you're done and now let's bond a dragon or two and become riders. before we begin our analysis of the stretch of chapters let us begin with our battle brief or the summary of what happens in chapters 11 through 15. Take it away, Nicole. Chapter 11, presentation is tomorrow, and our girl Vi has yet to complete the gauntlet obstacle course, and she's freaked, even wondering if Dane is right, gag, and if she should run to the scribes, because it's basically her last chance. But now it is gauntlet day, and shock of shocks, Dane's being a little completely ignoring Violet until finally talking to her in line and whispering, change your mind jackass but now it's violet's turn to shut him down as she climbs up the gauntlet sailing past the first three ascents using the rope to aid her in the fourth ascent and taking a dagger and plunging it in to help her up the fifth ascent but our girl she freaking made it however rule follower dane fucker amber mavis absolutely loses her shit on violet for the dagger maneuver but violet comes at her with some lawyer level codex technicalities and amber reluctantly concedes All the squad mates have made it up the gauntlet. Chapter 12. That was just part one of the day's events. Now they just have to parade in front of a hundred dragons. Simple enough. But wait, there's an additional dragon. A feather tail. Suspicious, but making it 101 dragons. Our squad walks a distance and they have some delightful banter talking about the gender of Rhee's sister's baby. Something called Venon and Wyvern. Dun, dun, dun. And how, when parading past the golden feather tail, Tynan believes they should kill it. Our friends really need to work on their communication skills. After the indecisive prior gets scorched, two dragons find Violet very interesting and sniff her dragon scale armor. They just smelled their buddy Tiny on her. But once they begin walking again, Luca continues being absolutely insufferable and is the second crispy victim of the day. Womp womp. The squad is down to six. Chapter 13, it's October 1st, and that means it's threshing day. After a brief pep talk from Professor Kaori, all of the cadets go off to bond with their dragons. 147 cadets, 101 dragons. What could go wrong? After several hours of wandering, Violet scales a tree to get a better look at the dragons, but what catches her eye? These three? guys planning to kill the little golden dragon. Again, what could go wrong? Standing up for the little dragon, Violet gets ready to face off with these three douche nuggets, and who walks into the clearing but our favorite wing leader, Zayden and his ruthless dragon, Segal. Chapter 14. Zayden can't interfere, though, not on threshing. So Violet begins to face off these three overly confident douche canoes, but our girl Violet is a quick learner, sinking a dagger in Jack's shoulder, homeboy runs off, coward, and Orin gets knocked out by Violet. Just when Tynan, her old squad mate, is about to kill her, Zayden takes a step forward. What could that mean? But something huge lands behind her. Our favorite middle-aged dragon has entered the chest. With an oh-so-satisfying step aside, silver one, the gigantic black dragon roasts Tynan alive. No no (laughs) womp womp for him. He deserves it. Holy shit, our girl has a dragon and she cannot believe it. Literally asking the black dragon, are you sure? After some lovely sassy lines from the grumpy dragon, she climbs on and they jump into the sky and Violet falls right off. Honestly, we would too. Chapter 15, Taryn swoops down and catches Violet, throwing her into the air and getting her back on his back. It's Circus Olay up in Bezgaia. Making it back to the flight field, Violet and Taryn are the center of attention, literally getting an eruption of roaring cheers from the other dragons. Side note, does everyone in Bezgaia just have ears damaged? Because that would be so loud. Violet is unable to do her normal rider dismount because both of her size and her injured ankle 
So Taryn shimmies his leg and helps her to slide down him like he's a, quote, lethal piece of playground equipment. The other dragons murmur, yes, dragons can do that. And Violet goes to tell the role keeper Taryn's name. But another voice enters her head, a soft female voice. The golden dragon. Don't you know you're not supposed to talk to writers that aren't yours? Well, after she gets to the dais and after Lilith wins coldest mother of the year award, Violet tells the dragon role keeper her dragon's full name and that she's bonded with Ternenach. The pronunciation could use some work. But what's that? The little golden dragon's voice. It just won't leave her alone. She says, and on a urum. And a shocked and confused Violet tells the role keeper the second dragon's name. All hell breaks loose. Let's go ahead. Let's tap into our signet power and start talking about the key insights, reflections, foreshadowing, and of course, all of our favorites, the theories. So Dane's not really a lot in this stretch of chapters. Thank he, God. I know, right? It's actually quite wonderful. But I still have to call out any points where we can look at Dane taking some major L's. So at the very beginning, Dane, they're at formation and Dane's literally not even looking at Violet. He's smiling at the entire squad. He's encouraging them. Like, you know, it's gauntlet day. Everyone's a little nervous, but he literally is ignoring his best friend. He It's described as he's passing her over. And then even her best friend, Ree, she observes like, hey, he seems kind of pissed off at you. Yeah. So oh. then he comes up to her in line, like as she's waiting for the gauntlet after literally, again, ignoring her all day. And he says, change your mind. It's not a question. It is a demand. And it is so notable because also in this moment, as narrator Violet says, his hand finds mine. So while this is not necessarily a cups her face section, however, we are several months into the school year now. And Courtney on TikTok made a really good point. Courtney said, what if he's using Violet to practice his signet power so he can use them on not just people's temples? So if that is the case, this would be an example of it. I would assume so. We're not really sure about that, but I just found that part very notable. I am going it, out of all of the, you know, ideas about whether Dane can. It's just it, it is full skin to skin. He's being a little secretive with the saying that is on the temples. I it, if I was going to go with the theory that it is more than just the temples, which you all know that I am pretty firmly in the just temples category here. Courtney makes a really good point here. That would be really good that he's he's learning and he would kind of be practicing on her, which just makes which, him an even bigger dick. Oh, man. Another thing that I want to point out from the section here as we're talking about Dane is he's mad at her for giving her squad mate Trina advice about being confident like he's so angry that she has confidence in herself and he just doesn't believe that she's capable and in turn worthy of being a dragon writer even though everybody else is allowed to but just not her as she's fighting him she says it's inevitable that one of us will have to bury the other this line did stand out to me and I was like could this be foreshadowing will Violet have to bury Dane if Dane does have a redemption arc will that be like his you know last hurrah and he's standing for Violet and then she has to bury him in like this really tragic burial scene I could see that being a thing, but there would have to be a redemption arc of the fucking century if that happened. I think that this is her just being as smart. As <laughs> I, I could see that too. I'm now in the point where I'm like, is everything foreshadowing? I don't know. Here's what I will say. If she has to bury Dane, I will add this to the list. I will add this to there our list. There you go. I will, I will allow that. And then I just, the one really good thing out of the pressure that Dane has been putting on her, not just right now, but throughout this, since she crossed the parapet, is this stretch where she really begins to believe in herself fully. You know, I just love how poetic it is. Instead of being forced into the writer's quadrant like she was on Conscription Day, she ends up getting to choose to be in it. And she'd rather be courageous and fight for survival and the chance to prove her worth both to herself and everyone else, especially her mom, versus hide in the safer option. And I just, I think it really reflects her decision to join the suicide mission at the end of the book. I, and and just as we're thinking about her hero's journey here, which is really the the central storyline in this first book of the series, is that this is just really necessary and so empowering. Yeah. And, you know, not meaning to jump ahead a little bit here, but when Amber insults her saying that, oh, you think like a scribe, Violet owns it. Like she's really proud of that because she knows it's a strength of hers and that sets her apart from the other writers. So let's move on to the gauntlet. If you want a full gauntlet breakdown, go listen to episode two. We do an entire analysis of exactly the obstacle course that is the gauntlet. I, I might, I, I'm still giggling about the giant hanging bolt. I'm a five-year-old We child. are four. <laughs> we are four. 
so, so, you know, she mentions that her memory, it's not going to get her off the gauntlet. But I would like to counter that, actually, because it really does. She uses what she knows and remembers about the Codex to her advantage. So give yourself a little bit more credit there. And also there's muscle memory. You know, I bet the beginning of that course, all of them after practicing it for two and a half weeks, that shit is on lock. So at the beginning of chapter 11, which is when they go up the gauntlet, Violet is noticing everyone's patches that noted that note their rank, that note their signets, and specifically noting Heaton's patch, which is a circular patch with water and floating spheres. Now, later on in the book, it's mentioned that Zayden doesn't wear any patches. I, it, it just stood out to me. It's like, why doesn't he wear any patches? Oh, I, I, th- I love this part because I, I think that he wears like the absolutely necessary one. Like, like he, that he's I think he wears like fourth wing, wing and yeah. that's about it. So I think like Violet, he recognizes these patches as weaknesses, as literally just putting it on broadcast. Hey, here's what I'm really good at. Here's all of my, my tools. The less the enemy knows about him and his strengths, which is something he is very consistent with his character, the more he has on them, the more leverage he has, the more he can pull out. A really good example of not showing everything that you have up your sleeve is from Princess Bride when Wesley and Amigo Montoyo are like doing their first, their, their big sword fighting scene. And both of them like pretend like they're left-handed. And it's like, ha ha. I'm not left-handed either. And then they continue. So like, it's like, oh, wow, they're both right-handed. You know, like, like I said, Violet is very similar to this way of thinking like Zayden. She, and I quote, I recognize them for what they really are, intelligence that I might one day need to defeat them. So another just parallel between Violet and Zayden and their lines of thinking. After Violet gets up the gauntlet, you know, Amber Mavis loses it on this girl. And I love that Zayden is not answering Amber. He literally just keeps looking at Violet. And it's literally even said he silently waits for me to respond. And I love this because it just shows how much he already trusts her and believes in her own abilities and intelligence to win her own battles. Dane would have never fucking done this. He would have been like, or like either getting up in Amber or her Violet's face, depending on the situation, or Mira would have immediately stood up for Violet and stood in front of her. Rebecca's mentioned how there's multiple times in the book where Dane steps in front of Violet, and there's multiple times in the book where Zayden steps to the side of Violet. And those are very deliberately constructed because stepping to the side is saying, hey, I'm here if you need me as support, but like, you've got this. Whereas stepping in front of is like, you're weak. And I can do this for you. One more thing about the gauntlet here. Oh, two more things, but one first. Is when Amber states that Violet is disqualified, like what happens if you are disqualified? I, I need to know this because like, are you just like pushed off the edge once it's like, whoop, nope, you're disqualified and you, you're, you gotta go. Bye. You are the weakest link. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Literally. Or, and, and this is kind of what, which, what, which I'm leaning to towards here, is that you're not allowed to go to presentation day. Your disqualification means, nope, you can't go to presentation, which inevitably means that you will not be able to bond with the dragon. Or like, do you have to leave? No, because you can't really leave Bezgaia if you either graduate or you die. You get pushed off the cliff. I'm kind of leaning towards you get pushed off the cliff or you get roasted by a dragon. Like, that would not surprise me here at Bezgaia. And last thing here to note on the gauntlet, I'm very impressed that only two people died during. I I wanted to pull the numbers on the death toll in these stretch of chapters because 171 start the gauntlet, 169 finish the gauntlet, but 147 make it to threshing. That means 22 people died at presentation. Like, that just really struck me. That's 22 people getting killed by the, by the dragons. And again, I think that that just one more way of reinforcing, whew, you can you can get through the gauntlet. You can do every, you can check all of the boxes. But hey, if the dragons don't like you, you're shit out of luck. I mean, see Pryor and Luca. Speaking of which, presentation. There's a quote right at the top of presentation. And it says, the leaves of the trees are all turning gold. And as though someone has brought in a paintbrush with only one color and streaked it across the landscape. I love the use of gold and only one in the same sentence. Right as our girl is about to bond two dragons, one of which who is obviously gold. But then a few pages later, when they're describing the senior wing leader, her uniform is described as having spikes on her shoulders. And it says they're gold and look sharp as hell. It was just a little nod to our golden little sharp one in Darna. During that moment, too, as Violet's, you know, doing her narration, it's like, oh, it's like she wanted to add a little extra badass today. I I really thought of you, Nicole, during that line. I was like, that is a Nicole line right there. My work here is done. So as they're leading up to presentation, Garrick and the senior wing leader are talking about, don't be afraid to look at the dragons if they are showing off their tails. 
And this just got me thinking. I was like, this just reminded me of like Tinder, where, you know, if you have like a dog in your photo or or you have like a shirtless photo or something like that, you're like way more likely to be swiped right on. Is presentation just basically modeled after Tinder for this reason? With like, oh, let me show you my tail. Like, you know, and like maybe you'll swipe right on me on brushing day, you know? I didn't know that you were ever on Tinder, Nicole. Lexi? I thought we'd both been in relationships for too long, like oh, that no. long. I had one Tinder experience, and it's when I was dating a lead singer at a 90s cover band, and I dislocated my kneecap at one of his concerts. But that is a story for an Ask Us Anything podcast episode. Right. I will not, oh my God. I'm not tell you my story favorite here. story of Nicole's. Please ask, like, oh, yeah, but that is my favorite story of all time. Like, I will pee my pants if I hear that story again. When my guy Garrett, I, I, I'm I, going to talk a little bit more about Garrick a little later. I really like him. Garrick says, if a dragon doesn't like one of you, it'll most likely burn the whole lot to weed one out. Is that what the new dragon Solus does to half of third squad in Iron Flame? Or is that just Solus being a dickwad i don't know but like after reading the iron flame excerpt that line really stood out to me because that's seemed like kind of what happens in in the next book god we listen to that whole bonus episode if you want us if you want to hear us talking about that for like 15 minutes but okay so if you're like me and you read this at least at least on the second reread and you were like huh i wonder how long of a walk presentation is you know to and fro well, I did the math for you. And this was me and my husband literally outlining this on Canva, figuring out what squares of dragons, like how it would look like if it was all in a line. So if dragons are all 25 feet tall, we can assume they're at least minimum 30 feet wide if they have their wings relaxed to their sides, not like stretched out by any means, but at least like a little relaxed on the side. Then we'll say about, you know, 15 feet in between them, you know, our dragons like a little bit of wiggle room. And there's 100 dragons, 50 per row, plus one smaller dragon, which will give an additional, like, I don't know, 15 feet for Andarna. So that's 4,515 feet one way, or 0.85 miles, or 1.37 kilometers one way, or 1.7 miles slash 2.74 kilometers out and back. I'm so impressed that you guys did that. That's that's really cute. I can totally imagine you guys doing that. And I can't wait to, to pop into our Canva and see the outline. Is Luca an idiot? Is she yeah. an absolute effing idiot? She says, it's fucking yellow. It's not even powerful enough to pick a real color. Last time I checked, Luca, yellow was a color. It's a primary color even. And, and especially when there's like browns. I consider yellow to be more of a color than brown. Yeah. Also, I, I don't know if she's like, it's not a color of the dragon wheel. She also says the dragons are underwhelming. Good lord. This girl sucks. Seriously. And it's like, it, it really highlights how there's essentially two types of cadets. Those who know that the dragons are in charge and respect that, like Vi and Re and whatnot. And those who don't, which yeah. some of those should do still bond like Jack, for instance, even though he bonds with a less powerful kind of blow on the totem pole dragon, but he still bonds. So it's interesting how how that works. Speaking of people who uh, I don't know, I don't know if I dislike Pryor, but he would annoy the shit out of me if we were trying to pick somewhere to eat. You and I are very decisive people. I But here's the deal. I have part of my, my, my day job is like studying decision fatigue and what that looks like in our brain. And I just like every time I think of prior, I'm like, oh, God, you poor, you poor son of a bitch. That really sucks. OK, so I've talked about this now on two podcast episodes. So I'm going to go into it in a little bit more depth here and more like a, a theory area. But Luca is dissing Violet and Rhiannon because both of them were talking about Wyvern and Venon and like, you know, the fables that their parents used to tell them. And they were saying it in a very like, you know, jokey, like, aha, you know, my parents used to tell me that I wouldn't be able to like go to bed on time if a Venon came at the bed, like stuff like that. Or like how Violet was like, oh yeah, my mom, I one time thought my mom was a Venon because she was tired from a work thing and she had red eyes. So, which I think is a highly notable line to look out for but luca literally says like that's just border village nonsense which is so rude but not long after she disses and totally discounts the wyvern and venon she gets roasted alive and right before she says this is luca saying about violet what she's obviously our weakest link after prior and no one wants that as their writer not only is she dissing violet who was just very obviously pro venon and wyvern she's also just being kind of a bitch so she immediately gets roasted did she get roasted because she didn't believe in venon 
and because she was roasting someone who did believe in venom. I love that you thought of this. I, I that did not occur to me when I was reading through this. And part of that is like there, there was like kind of the, the a scene in between where the drink green dragons are smelling her and all of that. I, I do have to wonder how far did they walk from when she was talking about that to, but oh, but the dragons do talk to each other, so. That good and point. do they have really good dragon hearing? Like, you know, the Fae have like really like, you know, they're pointy ears, so they have really good hearing. Maybe the dragons have expert hearing as well. So yes. speaking cool. of which, like after Violet talked about the Venom, she had two dragons approach her and like give her a little sniffiny sniff. It's it's highly implied that they're coming up to her because it's two green dragons. They smell their buddy Tiny on her, which is Mira's dragon, because Mira's dragon shed their scales. And Mira shrunk them down with the help of another rider and made a vest out of this for Violet. And so I do wonder, though, did those dragons also come up to her because she was talking about the venom and talking about the wyvern in a way that implied, yeah, yeah, they're fables, but like my mind is open. Yes, I love that. I also just like love this whole sequence on on presentation day and how they're having this discussion because Luca really represents like that ignorant Navarian. Their wards stop all magic not directed by dragons, but the problems are outside of the wards. Like the problem is not within Navar, at least right now that we know of. And Navar has just created a bubble for themselves and, and they love living in it and they have everybody drink the Kool-Aid. And Luca is one of those people who has drank the Kool-Aid. Let's talk Our about threshing. Threshing oh time. Uh, right before threshing begins, which is two days after presentation, Professor Kaiori tells them to pay attention to their surroundings and follow their feelings. And I just love this little nugget here because like how hardened of a culture this is, you know, live or die, blah, blah, blah. They're also saying, listen to your feelings. And of course, we all understand why with the bond and all that, but just listen to your feelings. <laughs> I have one more moment of Dane taking L's in this stretch of chapters. Violet says, I've only talked to him once in the past two days since presentation, and he tried to get me to run within the first five minutes. Did he not say anything about like, congratulations for making it up the gauntlet? Probably not. And then the other thing that he did say to her was that he was trying to talk her into a brown. So when I when I read this, I thought for sure, like, oh, he must have a brown then. Nope. I look nope. back. He, he has a red. Yeah. But the way that Reed just like shuts down any vote that he gets, like if I didn't already love her, I do now. Oh, I know. We're in threshing. And I want to ask you, like, do you know that feeling when you're at a party and you don't really know a lot of people and you're just kind of like, or maybe it's like a networking event. And you're I was going like to say like wandering. conferences right there. <laughs> oh my God, it's triggering. I was just at a conference two weeks ago and I called Lexi like sobbing because I was in one of these moments. You're just wandering around aimlessly and you're like, I don't really know anyone, but I need, I need to like keep walking around. That is what I imagine threshing being. And it makes me so anxious. <laughs> and, and then her relief when she sees that there are other cadets who haven't bonded. Like it's a sense of not being alone when you are alone. And that's really how, how I feel in this early motherhood. I have a one and two year old. I am in the thick of it. And it's kind of like that. Yeah, you're alone, but you're also not alone because, you know, there are a million and millions and millions of other moms doing the exact same thing. Anyway, it's just like that reminded me of that. But I OK, so one other thing here is the fact that she doesn't feel a connection to any dragons before, you know, the whole event with the three guys and, and Taryn coming in and whatnot. If she didn't try to save Andarna and Taryn didn't step in, would she have been one of the unbonded? I feel like we're getting into a destiny conversation. At that point. Oh, that's true. Because, like, I think Destiny played a huge role in this, obviously, because that's just fantasy stories and just stories in general. But also, maybe? But, I mean, that's kind of, to me, like, if Harry had chosen Slytherin House, you know, like, what would the difference have been? Oh, don't that's get me down other, that no, road. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> don't stop that. Like, Are you opening that door no, for me? No, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. Shut, slam. Slam. <laughs> so, so, speaking of these three guys who, and Darna, you know, who are going after and Darna... Why? 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 Why would you kill a dragon? What are you thinking? There's even a line later that I think it's uh, Tynan. He like he's about to get at Violet when he, they're fighting and and Darna like snaps her teeth at him and he like gets surprised and it's like, are, are you a fucking idiot? It literally even says like he just realized she had teeth. Yes, it's she's like, a dragon. I think that their cutthroat culture of weeding out the weak is just so ingrained in them. 
that they extend it to the dragons as well. In fact, Violet even wonders if the dragons have the same philosophy that the humans do in this regard, making the dragons glad that these humans killed the little one versus angry. Jack, for instance, truly believes killing the dragon is for the greater good. It's his quote unquote reason to be a complete sadistic prick. But the attitude of eliminating the weakest link, again, it's just really drilled into them where it extends to all other areas, including dragons. You know, speaking about these guys here, I want to know, where does Jack get all of this information about feather tails? Violet's really wondering this, and I am too. Like, is he talking out of his ass like usual? Or, or what? I don't know. There is a lot of mystery around Jack, though, because we never really learn his signet. And I'm going to save a lot of that talk for when we do learn more about signets when we start getting into signets in those chapters. But um, I've been emailing with listener John. Shouts to you, John. You're amazing. Thank you for sending us emails about Jack Signet and, uh, you know, their their theories around what that could be. So there's a lot unknown about Jack. I'm so on the fence. I'm like, was he just like a level one villain that was like a, an easy boss to like get out of the way? Or is he going to come back? Like there's some theories that's like he's going to come back as a venom. I don't really know about those. I think he I think he is dead. I, I definitely think so, too. I, I haven't gotten to that part of the reread yet. So then going off of memory here, but his dragon like was like cried Wars. out. There, there was yeah, something that something. that kind of meant that he was dead. I think yeah. he was a level one one bill and it was kind of like just there to show how much danger Violet was in and how ruthless some of these characters are here. We need to talk about Indarna's motive at being at Threshing because she was not supposed to be there like big dragon role, which we will get into in the archive section. I'm so excited. She was not supposed to be there, like, at all. She is not allowed to bond with a human. It is rule number one in drag for dragons. But was she seeking to bond? Like, why was she at presentation day? Two days later, why was she at threshing? Like, did the dragons not try to stop her? And what's more, what is she doing out in the clearing like that? Like, especially when she's supposedly in danger. Like, she is just wanting her stuff. She knows that she's a golden dragon. And, and then when these three people are there to kill her and she puts so much trust in and Violet to uh, maybe not like completely save her, but at least be there until before Taryn comes in, you know, and, and saves them all. Is she purposely being out in the open to have someone come and save her? Like, who is that how she tests to her worthy writer? Is she orchestrating this whole thing for Taryn to swoop in and save her and Violet? Like, I really need to know. And we're going to so talk about that way. I have so many Andarna theories. Oh, my gosh. Well, okay, so two things on that. Taryn later on says, like, no one tells Indarna what to do. So that just kind of tells you, like, she's this little sassy dragon and, like, she, she, you know, does what a girl wants, what a girl needs. But she does say later, she meaning Indarna, does say later when she speaks into Violet's mind, maybe I was saving you. Yes. And so I wonder if, honestly, this is, Indarna's almost the analogy for destiny here, where she comes in as destiny to be like, hey, I'm going to be here. I mean, even me as a reader, I was thinking, oh, Violet's going to bond with the golden dragon but then I thought that the golden dragon she was just there to like deceive us and say oh well Taryn's actually the one she's going to bond but I do wonder if Andarna was pulling the strings in the back end I I do have some theories which I'll get to in more in a second but that maybe I was saving you line is loaded and I feel like we don't even know 90% of the meaning of that yet oh yeah I'm going to save my Indarna theories for later. On this first section, I was, like I said just a second ago, I was convinced that she was going to bond with this golden dragon, especially when it says, this is Violet thinking to herself, and somehow I am certain in the marrow of my bones that it can't, meaning Indarna can't breathe fire. And I was so excited because I was also like, yes, like marrow for bones. This is like that gut feeling that Professor Kaori was talking about. But then I was also kind of like, and not bummed necessarily, but I was like, oh, she bonds like the little dragon like I wanted her to bond the scary big one and of course obviously she then bonds both and becomes the biggest badass ever yes and like it's just like they were already a team you know slaughtering us like they she they are already connected they are already a team even if they haven't officially bonded yet so I just love that they're meant to be together all right Lexi I'm convinced convinced that Zayden is an intrinsic are you ready I, I am. I texted you last night that you have finally convinced me, and I am so excited for you. I missed that text message. No, really? no, you didn't. didn't. I, we've texted so much in the past five days. <laughs> okay, so Zayden is an intrinsic. I am convinced, and here's why. Not only do we get yet another, multiple another's scalp prickle moments, this is all before she has bonded with Tarn, but right 
as Zayden is entering the clearing, as Violet is facing off with these three douche canoes, Violet realizes he cannot help. And she basically has like this, I'm going to die moment. And it says, and I have to quote this word for word, so much for hope. Zayden looks towards me and I swear I can see his jaw clench, even from this far away. Hope is a fickle, dangerous thing. It steals your focus and aims it towards the possibilities instead of keeping it to where it belongs, on the probabilities. Zayden's words come back to me with alarming clarity. So two things here. One, so much for hope. They talked about hope at the end of the last stretch of chapters where Zayden was basically like, yeah, hope's not a great thing because it takes your focus off of the probabilities and it puts it on the possibilities, which is not helpful for survival. But it says like, as she's saying so much for hope, which is this version of like, oh my God, I'm just going to die. His jaw clenches. And then he has this like moment where his words from a few weeks ago come back to her with alarming clarity, almost like they are being projected into her mind. Lexi, thoughts? I, yeah, that that's good. I like, I, and there's a few other instances that seal this for me. I didn't, I, I just, yes, just yes. That's all I have to say. There's another moment where this is later on in the in the fight scene right before Taryn comes and like boom shakes the ground so as she is literally accepting her death she says at least as one last move I made Jack run away it's not a bad last move like she's literally saying okay I'm gonna die and you know if I do I at least did this one thing and right after that is when Zayden takes a step forward so literally he's a she's about to accept her death so now you might be asking Nicole intrinsics are mind readers not mind speakers well we don't necessarily know that first and foremost but Zayden is also incredibly powerful if he is a intrinsic he's had three years to master this power I'm assuming someone at Arisha who is also a intrinsic is training him now here's the big or or he is just an intrinsic slash mind reader slash mind speaker with Violet now if we are opening up that can of worms, we could be looking into faded mates territory. And are we looking at a faded mates bond here? You know, we know that dragons can bond, which we'll talk more about in the archive section today. But can humans also bond? And would they have this mind to mind connection? But there's a line from Taryn later. Lexi, I think you pulled it. Yes, because later on, Taryn gets really mad at Zayden for trying to read him. And I don't think that was just him trying to just jump into his mind. I think that was a, whoa, don't mind read me, buddy. And yeah. that that line right there was when I was like, okay, I'm convinced. I am convinced. Absolutely. Yes. I've convinced you of two different theories in these past two podcasts. I am two for two and I feel so fucking good right now. I'm convinced that Zayden is an intrinsic. We'll have much more on this, I'm sure, as we go throughout the podcast. But please email us your theories. We're fantasyfangirlspod at gmail.com. Email us your theories on this because we want to read every morsel of them. <laughs> so Violet gets a lot of criticism for this like, girl, are you dumb? Of course, Zayden does not want to kill you. She gets so much criticism for this. I, I am one of her criticizers, yes, because it's like I even wrote a note in my ebook at this moment like when he's coming in to step in and she's just like oh my god he's gonna try to kill me I'm so confused it's like why like why are you confused still he has had so many opportunities as you have said many times and he has not even tried he's helping you and you know that he's been helping you so why do you still think that I I, I think that is one of her blind spots as we've talked about so I'm actually going to counter that. And I'm going to get over here on my psychology neurological bullshit for a second. This guy's dad murdered, air quotes, her brother. Her sister, one of her most trusted confidants in the world, has told her that literally, Zayden, this guy wants to kill you. Dane, her best friend from childhood. Like, we cannot negate the fact that they have been best friends since literal childhood. He has said the same thing. And when we grow up around these people, we trust these people very deeply and they say, hey, stay away from this person. Neurologically speaking, we are bound to believe what they have to say and have it as like a capital T truth. So it makes sense to me that she refuses to see the good sides that he is like what he's doing to help her. It's a big old blind spot for her because literally her brain, when you believe something so specifically, it refuses to believe that. Plugging in my neuroscience right there. 
I suppose so. I still think that she should be reading the room a little bit better here. But I but I get it. And same with that, like all of what she knows about Navarre at the end of the book, it's like shattered, like it, like her whole world is turned upside down. I think we'll be getting a lot more of that same theme about having to what's the word? Re reprogram. Reprogram, yeah. Like, like her brain is like she's gonna have to be reprogramming herself. Let's talk about the Zayden stepping forward moment. Obviously, outside of the Zayden is an intrinsic stuff. So, I do wonder what the conversation with him and Segal was right before he did this. Like, was she for it? Was she against it? Because she would have felt him battling. Like, do I go help her? Do I not? Like, but also, is this from a motivation of? this is Brennan's little sister, like, um, or is this from a motivation of, oh my God, the girl I'm falling for is in danger and she's about to die and I don't want her to die. He, he was not going to let her die. And I think that at that point, Segal was not in a position to to go after Tynan because, hey, he's like right there next to Violet. And if she went after him, then that would put Violet at risk. And I think that's kind of when she's like, Tynan, 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 I need you. Beep, beep. Oh, I have a lot to say about that in a little bit. So, okay, speaking of Taryn, our favorite middle-aged dragon. I love him. Right after Taryn lands, Violet says, the unbonded black dragon Professor Kaori showed us in class. That's how she describes him. And I love that she literally says this as he is choosing to bond her. She's calling him the unbonded dragon. I love it. Okay, so Taryn choosing to bond Violet. Do you think that Taryn saw, or I mean, maybe saw through Segale's bond even, how... Violet cares for defenseless ones and he thought of the people that the Venon were targeting and he knew that she would make a good writer to aid the rebellion and lead, you know, the most powerful dragon. Because that's my headcanon as to why he chose her. I, I I think that, yeah, like on the surface, it was because she defended the little one. Like there's definitely truth in that and there's so much more to it. He, he wasn't meaning to bond. It was kind of like that, oh, you don't find the one you're destined to be with until you stop looking. I, I think that Sigal might have been kind of keeping an eye out. And and I, I again, that goes back to why was Indarna there in the first place? Indarna is essentially the adopted child of Tan and Sigal, but she was there at presentation day. Taryn was not. Was she planning to, to bond? And I just, I don't know. But I think that there was not a set plan of, okay, we're going to go in. We're going to bond with Violet. Boom. We're good. I yeah. don't think that was the I, original plan. I do think that Sigail through, you know, when her and Zayden are chilling in the clearing watching Violet defend, I think Sigail sent out the beacon, the Batman symbol to Taryn and was basically like, I know you weren't planning on bonding, but you're going to bond this year. <laughs> like, like, Kind of like yes. decision <laughs> made. <laughs> One other thing, too, is that once when Taryn does bond with Violet, Zayden and Sakeel just go off. It's like, okay, cool. Our work here is done. So and see, I actually, I read that as like, I want to give them their time to like have this moment together because this isn't about us. This is about them. Oh, that's a really cute way of thinking of it. I that's like the that. That's romantic in me. I was like, you know. <laughs> I like, don't think this, like that at all. <laughs> this explains so much about us. <laughs> but also like we have to wonder like, how does he know her name? Because she's taken aback by that. And, you know, she, she asks like, how does he know? And he responds with, and to think. I'd almost forgotten just how loquacious humans are. Wait, really quickly. For those who didn't know what loquacious means, like I personally didn't, it means to talk a lot. I, I also had to Google that. Yeah. Let's note, he does not answer her question. Like, he he doesn't answer her question. So how does he know about her, Brennan? Like I just thought is. it was some dragon magic. Possibly. But no, that's a great point. Or yeah. Does he know who she is from the exchange with Zayn and Segal? Probably. That's probably. Or does he know who she is from his knowledge slash participation in the rebellion and therefore Brennan? Possibly. So anyway, so I just, that was a, an interesting thing that I know. It's also so poetic that the writer who we are assuming saved Brennan's life, the writer of that dragon chooses to bond Brendan's little sister. Right. Brennan's little I, sister. I love that. And similarly, Zayden's grandfather was bonded with Segal, which is a huge no-no in dragon law. Even though Taryn's previous writer was not related to Violet, they still have a connection. So it says that Taryn hasn't been seen in the last five years. What was this dude doing for five years, do you think? That is a really good question. So first of all, we, we know that he was in the Vale because yeah. he has to be close to Segal. And Segal is essentially stationed um, at the writer's quadrant at Vescaius because Zayden is doing, you know, his third year stuff there. However, 
he knows so much about the current rebellion that and and Sigail is clearly going to these other outposts. She, she, you know, she and Zayden are, are flying around in the dead of night. I would imagine Taryn would be joining them on some of those. Now, the question is, though, he is a gigantic black dragon. You'd think a few people would notice a gigantic black dragon flying around the continent, right? I do wonder if this is like a toothless situation, though, where like since it is a gigantic like a black dragon, you and at know, night, he's almost yeah. invisible. Like, I do wonder if that... But, I mean, Toothless was also not the size of Taren. So I'm going to say the veil, but I I am curious about where else, because I don't see him just chilling in the veil for five years. <laughs> like, no. just, like, only doing that. So, personally, I have never ridden a dragon yet. What? I have. Oh. I ride horses. Is that count? <laughs> That's not a dragon. <laughs> but Violet is riding this dragon exactly how I feel like I would be, which is just cursing like a sailor. And also, Lexi, you have totally ruined me because I cannot listen to these books anymore without hearing Joe from The Princess Diaries. Like, right. especially when he's like, we're gonna have to put on a show. I was like, that is, I swear to God, a line from The Princess Diaries. Uh, another note, you know, you're mentioning like riding the dragons. Violet mentions that Professor Curry was, you know, teaching them how to ride dragons i just imagine all of them like on these pretend dragons like in class like riding around like like you know like those like ponies like at the at the grocery store right like here's what i pictured and if you've ever done like any behind the scenes of house of the dragon you'll know what i'm talking about but like in the behind the scenes of house of the dragon these like the actors have to be sitting on these like dra- dragon saddle yes. models. It's not the full dragon. It's just a dragon saddle model. Almost like a mechanical bull status where it's like moving all over the place. And I do wonder if they have one of those. I just guys. imagine them like in class doing that. Anyway, it was- I love that they have that and not pens. <laughs> so we have to wonder like why does Taryn cater to her weaknesses so much? It's known that dragons don't supplicate for anyone. So why does he do this for her? Like why does he help her mount? or dismount why catch her while falling because clearly not all dragons are most other dragons are not doing that like has it is it because she's already proven her worth to him or is it something else I think it's definitely like you you know how Professor Kaori mentions earlier in the book like there's more to bonding a dragon than strength and cunning it's like courage and kindness and and I think that Taryn sees that and he's like I don't see these as weak like everyone has their weaknesses everyone has their strengths and just because Violet's weaknesses tend to be not aligned with a lot of the other dragon yeah, writers the, the, their that, physical weaknesses I think that he sees this as the other things that she has like that no other writers do far out way anything that he would need to do so I do think he's also looking way bigger picture here I think he sees like okay you know a leg shimmy here and there and a leg shimmy here and there but he sees what the potential is for her and her power and what she can bring to the table here and I think he's like this is a small quote-unquote price to pay in order to have this girl who I'm going to assume is going to co-lead the rebellion with Satan. I have a question about his previous writer if Taryn was on the rebellion side which we we can kind of assume because of you know his mate bond with Sigail and his involvement with that towards the end was his last writer too and if is that why he resurrected Brennan because they were both on the rebellion side and somehow nobody else knew about it? I think that Tarn and Naolin were on the side of Navarre at the beginning and then they were they saw the light for lack of a better term and they went over to the rebellion if not even they were like spies because they I'm assuming that they were pretty heavily involved with the Navarian side of things I assume that they were heavily involved in the rebellion side however so I do wonder if they were almost like a spy it's it's so possible and and we have to know remember too Sigail was not bonded at that time because she bonded with Zayden less than three years ago and I think it's pretty safe assumption that she was not bonded with a different writer five years ago or, or maybe Taryn told Naolin, like maybe Taryn always knew like, hey, this is what's happening. And he was one who convinced Naolin to like buy into what was going on. Oh, my God. There's so much there. And he also says like as they're descending from the flight that they made their point. Like you quoted this earlier, like, OK, we made our point. What point was he trying to make? I think he was just trying to be like, I'm the biggest badasses dragon. Like we need to come in in 
dial. Like it's like Joe from the Princess Diaries who <laughs> got the stretch limo for Mia. And he was like, you can't come in on your little scooter. You have to go in in style. So I imagine this being like him being like, we need to go into the in style. So speaking of Taryn, because I can never get enough Taryn, he is a literary freaking achievement. This guy is the most coveted dragon in the Vale. He's literally the dragon that other dragons move to make room for in the center of the field. I also love that he like he's like plops down and he's like scooch excuse me oh, excuse me like we got to get here in the center of the field and like stands up super tall like they're just like the most important. I love it. They roar at they meaning the other dragons roar as Taryn and Violet enter the field. And yet I do not think twice when I read the passage the closest thing to a dragon rolling his eyes that I've ever seen. Like this is this character is a literary achievement in my mind. I- I am just so excited to learn more about the culture of dragons. Like you get yeah. so like you just get to like peek behind the veil in this chapter here in this around threshing. And now I, I also wonder like are they roaring when every new writer comes in? Like kind of like you know like at the end of a marathon and everybody's cheering like the next person in. That was how I read it, not just right. Taryn. I I read it as it was just Taryn because he's like the biggest baddest dragon of them all. Yeah. Well, and they also were probably like, oh, hey, dude, didn't see, we didn't expect to see you yeah, here, like, man. You bond, bro. <laughs> he's also just such a dad, too. He's such a dad because the way that he compliments Violet and her throat tightens, she has not had a dad in, in over a year now. And she and her dad were very, very close. And he gives her a praise that she really needed to hear. Like, she hears it from her squad mates and stuff like that. But, like, she needed to hear it from a dad. And yeah. that's kind of what it becomes, which, by the way, I do not know how I would feel about having a middle-aged, grumpy old man <laughs> in my head for the rest of my life. Like, let's, let's hear your thoughts on that. I'm going to save most of my thoughts for when we cover chapter 30 and 32 of this okay. podcast. <laughs> but outside of that side of life, I do think that he is quiet a lot of the time, unless he's like making a sassy comment. This to me is like a big curmudgeon of almost like a life coach just in your head at all times. Like that's kind of what I hear Taryn as because he's like, he's encouraging her, but he's being an ass about it. Like he literally says, you're bleeding. Stop it. <laughs> so like, wait, wait, real quickly on that note. Zayden says something very, very similar. Like when she, you know, finishes the gauntlet and her palms are just completely torn up from the ropes. And he's like, you're leaking. Do something about it. That's what it was. Yes. (laughs) I don't know if I'd actually be too mad about having Taryn in my head all the time. Yeah. I I mean, it definitely comes in handy. But at the same time, it's like, oh, man. (laughs) I do want Like you're sitting on the pot and you just have a dragon talking to you. You'd never be bored again. I was going to say, like, they don't have iPhones, right? So (laughs) (laughs) they can't scroll through TikTok. So this is the equivalent. We're going to we're going to shelf talk about Taryn for right now. You know, we will be talking about this so much more throughout the entire rest of this podcast series. But I need to take a moment for Sawyer because he needs way more recognition about like everything. I, I love his character. He's bought into becoming a writer even after failing the first time. Like just, just take a moment and imagine going through all that they have and then not bonding, like not being considered worthy of one of these dragons after everything they've done, after everything they have proved themselves. And it's just like, it would be so soul crushing. Like I'm, I'm so empathetic and my heart just goes out to all of these writers who are not bonding except for Orin, he sucks. It, and then to muster up the courage to do it again and just to hope that this time that a dragon does choose you. Like, Violet is absolutely terrified and feels like a failure because she doesn't feel a connection with any of these dragons. Like, it's such a huge fear going into this and there's no control that you have over it. And you can just tell that Sawyer is so, so nervous about bonding with a dragon this time because, like, just from the way that he memorized every single dragon willing to bond and it kind of, like, he was kind of caught off guard with, with the feather tail there because he just needs to be perfect so that it works out this time. And he's strong and he got up a gauntlet flawlessly on their very first practice day. Like Violet even reflects on like, oh my gosh, how did he not bond with a dragon last year? Like what is the rhyme or reason for these dragons to choose their person when amazing people like Sawyer who are strong and protective of their friends that have a good heart and are smart don't bond. Is there a rhyme or reason or did the dragons know that his his person was going to be coming the next year? Like I just I'm curious. Ooh. I love that idea of like the dragons just like have like they know the greater plan. They knew that there was going to be a red dragon who needed Sawyer next year. And I do love this idea but like they can't communicate that to 
Sawyer, obviously. Like, would you have the courage to do that? I truly don't know if I would. But do you have another choice? Like, can you I don't go think to another you do. quadrant? That's a good question. But it does say earlier, like, they ch- they yep. choose to come back. Like, so I do wonder if they can go to another quadrant. I do. Like, wonder. again, my heart just, like, goes out. And, like, you know, like, when all of their friends meet up together and he's just so excited for his dragon. Like, I was just cheering him on. You know, this fictional side character who doesn't get a lot of page time. Just so happy for him that he bonded, like, more than anybody else, you know, after everything he's been through. And and Violet represents the reader when she's feeling that way as well. I hope we get more Sawyer and Garrick next book. Because we don't have Liam. Shut up. Don't you open that can of worms. Don't you open my heart stitches that I have stitched together since the first time I read that book. No. I want to talk about Lilith. Lilith. Because Lilith is sitting on the dais and like all of the teachers are, you know, they're, oh my God, what is that? They can't believe you bonded. Da, 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 da. And Lilith cuts them off and says, don't say it. Like it meaning his name, not until she does. So the Lilith is a bad guy version of this. She wants to make sure that Taryn is really Violet's because if they say his name, she could steal it and like tell the rule keeper, like she would be able to dupe Taryn whatever but I'm trying so hard to figure out what is the Lilith is a Snape like character version of this because I'm struggling I don't I don't see it I, I I mean we have to just understand like her character she is a hardened general who sh- she does love Violet ultimately I, I do believe that but that's she, she's never shown that so why would she start showing it now like I don't think that she, she this is not a mask this is just her personality this is almost her way of saying, good job, Violet. Like, I bet that's literally what she's thinking in her mind. I want to talk about Melgren, however. This yes. is really cool. So there's a moment that Melgren is looking at Violet with just pure venom in his eyes. And I saw a theory from Paige Turner on TikTok. Thank you, Paige Turner. That since Melgren can see the outcomes of battles, he's known all along that Violet is going to play a role in the rebellion because she does not have a rebellion relic. So if he can see the outcome of battles, he will be able to see her. Seeing her come in on Taryn's back is just like this confirmation of, oh shit, it's about to get real. However, another way we can look at this is because she's bonded with Zayden now through the dragon bond, she's almost marked one status. So maybe he was, he meaning Melgren, was able to see the outcome of this battle and they were coming out on top but now he's no longer able to see the outcome of the battle because she's now with Tarn. so I do wonder because like I don't think that's a throwaway line I think it's one of these two things yes it's like I kind of always am forgetting about his signet and it's like I that is not one that you should forget about two things so you know I don't know if he would be able to see the outcome of her role in the rebellion because he's not able to see anything going on in the current rebellion because of the three or more marked ones. And the other question here is what defines a battle? Like was her was her encounter with Jack and Orin and Tynan was that considered a battle? And that's how he saw the out like did he see the outcome there? I don't think so. But there is that question of what defines a battle. But I do love this idea that he was able to see the outcome of this big civil war. And now he can't see the outcome of it because she is now bonded with Zayden, getting her marked one status. I love that idea. Keep that in the back of your mind, friends. And go check out Paige Turner on TikTok because she has a lot of really cool theories on there. Uh, Also, like while we're just giving shout outs, like Crystal, she has fantastic TikTok theories as well. You got to go check them out. Let's talk about dragon names because they are very purposeful in their meanings. I'm not going to get into it too deep right now because I don't want to jump too far ahead of ourselves, but I am going to just like they are very purposeful. And I think they set us up for this second signet opportunity as well. <laughs> Nicole, I'm so, ex- I'm so excited for this. I can't even tell you. Oh my God. Uh, so Taryn's full name, it would, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. Have him be mad at me. Taryn. It, and- it means thunder, lightning and thunder. Woohoo. So Gail means shadows. And then Coda, which is the black dragon that Melgren has, means war outcome of battles and then aim sir which is her mom's brown dragon it means weather her mom can um wield storms and then we we haven't learned this yet we haven't met liam quite yet but day means ice that's not his signet but wait he was wielding ice in the battle okay we're getting way ahead of ourselves but just needed to throw that one in there and last but not least here nicole can't even sit still in her seat guess what andarna's name means the second honor Ah, oh my God. 
the so second good. honor. I don't even I need to chills. describe that. I, I don't even need so, to describe that. I love it. I love oh, it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And now it is time for my favorite section of the podcast, which is God fucking damn it, Dane. There's no cupping of Violet's face in this stretch of chapters. So we're just going to do a touching Violet count. If it is only face touching, we have a count of four. We are up to chapter 15. He has touched her four times on the face. Any and all other touching, however, we previously had a count of 13. We added one in this stretch of chapters because he grabs her hand in line on the way to the gauntlet. Note that the other touching does not include face touching. So if we're going overall touching count, we are at 18. And now let's talk even more about foreshadowing. I know we kind of always sprinkle it in, but we got to pull out some of these really good nuggets from the stretch of chapters. Violet getting stuck on the gauntlet because her size is going to, quote, fuck her. Well, her size ultimately doesn't matter so much because her dragon helps her in ways that have the other dragons judging and muttering. We, we talked about that too. It's not going to be a problem for you, girl. And then, of course, Amber saying, we live by the rules or die by them. I don't even need to say more on that. Like, mm-hmm. that's just the definition of foreshadowing right there. Garrick at one point says, relax, feather tails don't bond. And right after I read that, I was like, okay, well, that's Violet's dragon. Right? When, when Tynan is like, who would ever want to bond a feather tail? That's when I was like, oh, Violet, Violet, well... When in presentation, Violet and Rhi are talking about family communication, and Violet says, thinking about Mira, there are bonds that can't be broken. I want to pull this out real quick, because what are your thoughts on this? This could be foreshadowing. Like, are Mira and Violet going to have a falling out when Violet joins the rebellion? Akash, I hope not. But I, I, I don't think that Mira, Mira is going to go to the side of the rebellion. Like, she, Really? Unless her mom also does. Because remember, Mira is just like her mom. I think. And I think that she is going to probably side with the mom. I'm worried. I'm really worried about Mira and I'm worried about their bond. What if they have a falling out and then Mira dies? <gasps> Don't you speak those words, Lexi. Uh, nope. The feeling we're going to get another death in, I know we're going to get another death in Iron Flames minimum and I feel like it's going to wreck us. I don't want to start speculating that yet, though. In the same conversation with Rhiannon, Violet says, you have a real future here, Re, And I totally think that's nod, nod, wink, wink, hint, hint, that she's going to be a squad leader next year. Talking about Tynan, Violet says, I pity the dragon, if any, that chooses him. Well, he dies before he can be picked by a dragon. So sucks to suck for that guy. Violet, during presentation, she's talking about the wyvern with Re, And she mentions that they have two feet instead of four. This is really important because in the mega big battle at the end of this book, she notices that there are two feet on the dragon's quote unquote, that are coming in. And that is what tells her that these are wyvern. And and then Taryn says he didn't think that he would survive this long either. And he and Violet have that in common. So is he referring to battle or was he so sad about his last writer? Yeah. I think he was so sad about Naolin because I think Naolin resurrected. The more and more I think about it, I do think Brennan was not fully dead. I do think he was like on that last sliver before dying. And Naolin like brought him back to life, basically. And I think that tore Taryn apart because it was by his own free will that Naolin did this. So Uh I think that he was so distraught that his writer died. And that's why he's saying, like, the next time I bond, I'm it's going to be deeper because that's how dragon magic works. He didn't think he was going to make it out of Naolin's death. I see. Yep. From Tarn, speaking about Orin being unconscious, he says, He would kill you if given the same chance. And yeah, while Violet is unconscious sleeping, he does try to do this. And while she's unconsciously sleeping, and he's just a peach of a human, that Orin. Good job. Let's go into the archives. We are super excited about this particular archive section because guess what? We are talking about dragons. We don't know a lot about them yet, especially about the Empyrean yet in this book series. So I really hope this doesn't get too dated as soon as Iron Flames comes out. But today's (laughs) archive section is a crash course in Dragons 101. First things first, let's talk about dragon society and culture. So the dragon's government is called the Empyrean. Hey, Nicole, isn't that the name of this book series? Can I confess to you something? I didn't know that was the name of this book series until a week before we launched this podcast. (laughs) And I will say this, it wasn't until after we launched the podcast or or started working on the podcast, at least, that I knew that the Empyreans were the the dragon government that kind of went over my head there in the first read. Let's think about that. The book series name focuses on the dragons, not Beskaya, not the people, not Violet. And it's dragons. 
So I think that this first book, it was a hero's journey for our main female character. And the, the second half of the book series is going to focus a lot more on the dragons. We have barely scratched the surface with this dragon culture. And the series name, to me, it's a promise that we will learn so much more. Humans, they don't know anything about Empyrean affairs. And the dragons shield themselves when the Empyrean are huddled together like they do right after threshing because they do not want their bonded writers to have any knowledge of the goings-on um, between them. You'd think that humans not knowing anything about the Empyrean affairs would make this section shorter, right? You <laughs> must not know us very well. So similarly, the humans have no influence over dragon law. Remember, the dragons are in charge of this partnership, right? It is absolutely a partnership, but there's that one person who's like, you know, the grade A student who's doing a lot more of the extra work. And then there's the uh, humans. The, the, remember, the dragons are in charge of this partnership. We've said on all, every single episode here, the humans are the pets. The dragons are not. Dragons, they live in the veil where no human has ever been allowed. If any human does try to go to the gorge leading to the veil, they will be incinerated. Except maybe there's something going on with those who have rebellion relics. We kind of touched on this a little bit in episode two. Just throwing that possibility out there. The veil, it is this gigantic valley behind Beskayeth Puar College. So it's located in the center of Navarre and it's guarded by the cliff that the gauntlet is built into. The power that radiates from the veil powers Navarre's wards and protects the kingdom from Pormiel's raiding parties and this never-ending war. That's where this partnership really does come in. The dragons need the humans to help channel that power and the humans obviously need the dragons. So this brings me into the next point of our discussion here, the dragon bond. Now, dragons will choose one, 99.9% .9 of the time, one rider that they deem worthy to bond with for the human's life or the dragons because RIP my boy Liam. But why do dragons bond with humans? So they ultimately need one another for protection, right? That's what I was talking about there in the, with the veil and how it powers all of Navarre, their wards. So dragons bond with riders to protect their home, the veil, from the enemy. That's kind of what like the dragons get out of this, why they're doing all of this that we know of right now. So when a dragon bonds with a human, they channel their magic into the human to create a unique signet power for that human. We will dive way more into the signet part of the dragon bond in a later episode. We're going to do an archive section on signet powers. But for right now, it is important to know that dragons have their own magic, like Andarna's ability to freeze time, which they purposefully do not pass along to humans. That is why baby dragons, they're not supposed to bond because they cannot control that unique magic of theirs. This unique magic of theirs, it evolves into a new power once when they grow. So that is why we can absolutely assume Indarna will not be able to freeze time when, now that she's grown up. When dragons feel their rider is ready, they channel their power into them via this bonded relic that they get on threshing day. And that channeled power manifests into something unique that represents the rider at their core. Again, so much more on this later. Going to stick to the dragons part right now. So fewer and fewer dragons are choosing to bond with humans in recent years. There's a lot of speculation as to why this is. For instance, are there just fewer dragons in general? Like, are they being killed off like Andarna's parents were by maybe the same magic that is giving the venom more strength? Then we, of course, have the popular theory that fewer dragons are bonding because they disagree with Navarre's politics and their quote-unquote out of sight, out of mind philosophy when it comes to the rest of the world being threatened and destroyed by the venom. Or maybe they, it's even a little bit of both. We don't know that yet, and I can almost guarantee we will learn more about why dragons are not willing to bond in subsequent books. Dragons don't emotionally recover from the loss of their bonded writer, especially when the bond is strong. Dragons don't bond with a lot of writers. Of course, they live for several hundred years. Terran is, is said to be over 100 years old and he's considered middle age and humans obviously do not live that long. So of course they will have multiple bonded writers, but there is definitely a little bit of a, you know, if they have more than four writers, for instance, kind of like a, a, a reflection on the dragon, not necessarily on just like their, their, their life's journey, I suppose is the right way of putting it. So let's talk about the rules of dragon bonding because wow, dragons have a lot of rules. Dragons, they don't beg humans for anything. They don't go out of their way to cater to their writer and especially any other human who's not their writer. If the writer is too weak to deal with the strength and power that are dragons, 
then they don't deserve to live. That's just, we we all have learned this. And the fact that Taryn is making these accommodations for Violet is just so out there. Rule number two, dragons only reveal their full name to their bonded writers. And number three, they only talk to their bonded writers. Again, we, we break a lot of these rules in this book. Yeah. And number four, it is forbidden for dragons to bond with relatives of a previous writer. That is why it is such a big deal that Sigil does bond with Zayden because his grandfather was bonded with her as well. And, and actually, I realized we were speculating who that bonded writer was in episode two. It's, it's a grandfather. I, I just read a little bit further. Sorry. Yeah. And number five, which is actually the biggest rule of all. I should have ranked these in order. Baby dragons are not allowed to bond. In fact, humans are not allowed to see baby dragons at all. This book's dragons are just breaking all of the rules, but that is big, big, big rule right there. Notably, there is not a rule against two dragons bonding with one writer because it has never happened. It just shows, again, how big of a deal this is, not just for the humans, but also for the dragons. That's kind of like the main rules there. Separate from the writer bond, dragons, of course, have mating bonds too. The stronger the bond, the more their lives literally rely on one another. Maiden dragons cannot be without each other for more than a few days or their health goes south, which is very convenient for our forced proximity here between Zayden and Violet. Now let's move on to the types of dragons. Dragon breeds are distinguished by their different tails and colors. It's my understanding that tails and colors can mix and match with some combos being far more rare or strong than others. So there are six tail types and I'm ranking them here from most deadly and powerful to least. So first up, we have the Morningstar tail, which is a mix of the dagger tail and club tail, biggest, baddest of all. And then under that, we have the dagger tail. Then we have the sword tail, club tail and a scorpion tail. And last but not least, a feather tail, which we of course later find out are baby dragons. But humans don't know that. So all they know are that feather tails are mysterious and they avoid violence. They're unstable and unpredictable, you know, like toddlers. And they're <laughs> not good for bonding because they can accidentally pass their own magic to the human. So, OK, now the colors of dragons and their associated traits. So black, we got the deadliest, the biggest, the baddest, the most powerful species in Navarre. And they are the rarest, minus golden. Again, more on that here in a moment, because none have been been born in the last century. So black morning star tails, which are what Taran and Coda are, they are even rarer with only two known in the world. Black dragons are also the smartest. They're the most discerning, the most cunning. I think that is a perfect match for our girl Vi. Then we have the blue dragons. They are known for how big they are. Thanks to Gale here. They are the most vicious of all dragons, especially blue dagger tails, who are the rarest and most ruthless. And while none were willing to bond this year, there are a few blues in active service, specifically where the fighting is most intense, in the Espen Mountains. Then we have the brown dragons, and all we know about them is never show fear or apprehension to a brown dragon. Cool, that's all we know right now. Awesome, Boopy. moving forward. <laughs> Green dragons, they are known for their intellect and they are the most rational of dragons, making them particularly great siege weapons, specifically green club tails. Now you have to show the mission and patience when approaching these dragons. I would imagine that's probably the case for all dragons, but it's particularly for green dragons. And then we have red dragons. All we know about them is that they are the quickest to temper, especially red scorpion tails, and you should never look a red dragon in the eye. And then we have orange dragons, which which come in varying shades of apricot to carrot, and they are unpredictable and therefore the most risky of dragons. And then last but not least, surprise, we have golden dragons. And Darna is the first dragon anyone has ever seen or heard of that is golden. So we don't know if it is because if she's just a golden dragon and that's her color or if she's golden because she's a baby. I think it is just her actual color, because at the end of the book, Zayden mentions that she's huge now, so we can assume that she's either full-grown or close to full-grown, but he didn't mention anything about her color changing. Very true. Now, one thing I do want to point out about all of these different color dragons is that each of them descends from a different lineage. I did not include those in the colors because I am absolutely butchering their names, <laughs> and I don't want Darren to get mad at me. But noting that, for instance, when Taryn gives his full name, he says, you know, the descendant of blah, 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 blah. And then in Darna, she doesn't give any lineage when she gives her name. Why? More later on that. Not today uh, in a different episode because we just don't have time today. Final thoughts on dragons here for the archive section. Like I mentioned, we 
don't know a lot about dragon politics, but we are starting to learn that some of them, like Segale and Terran, decide with the rebels. And so can we assume that the Empyrean dragon government here is divided in siding with Navarre and siding with the rebellion? Like, did General Melgren's black dragon, which we should note is even bigger than Terran, purposely create a loophole when branding these kids with rebellion relics, making sure that if more than three are together, his writer cannot use his powers. That would be oh, quite the plot twist, that. right? I love that theory. Or, you know, does senior leadership's dragons like Solus from the Iron Flame excerpt side with their writers because, of course, like they're so connected and so close after so many years together, which would create a split in the Empyrean. This is, I, I'm leaning towards this case as much as I love the theory that Coda purposefully created this loophole to help the the rebels be masked from his writer's power but come on everyone where is the fun if all of the dragons are secretly rooting for the same side like we gotta have some dragon drama i didn't i never knew i wanted that so badly dragon <laughs> drama <laughs> why would they bond with loyal navarians like dane if they were siding with the rebellion i think they're definitely like they're bonded with their writer and they're, they side with the writer and they're so torn like they had to have a huge meeting after threshing because they did not approve that violet had two dragons Right. So if they were all on the same side and all like rooting for the rebels or really wanting, you know, Violet to succeed, you wouldn't think there'd be that big of a problem. I think that we're start already starting to see a divide between the dra between the Empyrean. Well, I'm assuming the dragons know like th there there's a war coming. That makes so much sense. But then why would they let Indarna and Ter maybe because Indarna is a baby and she doesn't really fight. They were like, Why did anyone they... allow Andarna to be there in the first place? Like Sigil even no says- No one tells Andarna what to do. <laughs> but, and again, she didn't include her lineage. So yeah. I I've seen a theory floating around that Andarna is essentially like royalty or in, in dragon culture. Like she is part of the hierarchy of dragons. And that is why even as a baby, nobody tells her what to do. And that's oh, why she's I a golden dragon. It. Like that's why she's so- different and unique and and i think that she's going to be the most powerful is because she has like a, a, almost like a royalty status among the dragons and that's why she didn't give her lineage because if she did oh oh yep. my god i love that me too me too god, I, love I hope that, that happens and this like oh mm, i love it all right now let's wrap up today's podcast episode with taking flight with our favorite moments I, I know I gave uh, Sawyer his his time in the limelight here. Now let's pass it along to Riddick. I just love the way that Riddick cheers Violet on. He believes in her. He celebrates her. You know, cheering, that's our girl. When she finally beats the chimney on the gauntlet, you know, he sandwich hugs her with Re, like hollering and happiness. And then, you know, once when they're all bo bonded, which I think we'll get to in the next section of chapters, like, who is the baddest one of all of us? You know, yeah. something along those lines where I just love Riddick so much. Such good comic relief. He is such good comic relief. And here's a few more moments that he has. So the senior wing leader right before they go into presentation mentions like talk. And then Riddick comes back with nice day for a presentation. <laughs> and then right after Luca gets roasted, he says, guess the dragons think she's insufferable too. And I just, I love that. But um, oh, I love this moment with Dane, which I never thought I would say, but it's because Violet puts him in this place. He says, what changed between the parapet and now? And Violet goes, me. So after Luca is like, I have a question. And Garrick's like, OK, fine, whatever. And then she starts just like stating facts. And he's like, that's not a question. Like, I love Garrick. I cannot wait to learn more about Garrick. I really hope we get more Garrick in the next book. <laughs> He he does not get enough credit. I, I mentioned this earlier oh. in the podcast episode, but like he really sticks up for Violet a lot. When Even before Mark she went, and Zayden are bonded. Yes. When he doesn't know anything about her from when the marked ones, you know, were gathered under the tree earlier on. He stood up for her then. He reminded them, hey, she's in this death sentence place too, right? And yeah. then with Amber, like he's telling Amber to back the hell up, you know? And then we have so many more Garrick moments too coming in the future of this. He this gives book. her a new, he gets her a new armoire. <laughs> like, he like, oh. he like redecorates her room because her friend Zayden fucked so hard. <laughs> that is a good best friend right there. <laughs> and then, okay, so the way that Violet recognizes Re is nervous in the presence of the dragons. So she starts talking to her about her future niece and nephew. Like, I, again, this is, just such a warm and fuzzy moment where we really see how great of a friend Violet is. And then later when Reed tells her she doesn't need her to protect her, 
Violet counters that that's just what friends do. And that's all the more fuel for the theory, in my opinion, that her second signet is all about protection and just being there in some way or another for those that she loves. And then on the same lines of presentation day, when Violet tells a story about her family and, you know, how like her book of fables was taken away for a month, like it's like her phone and it it really humanizes her mom you know, like she's this big, scary general to everybody, including her. But there are these like little moments of humanity that we are seeing peek through throughout the story that I, I really do love. When Violet thinks that she's going to be incinerated by the green dragons, she thinks of how sad her sister Mira is going to be when she reads the death rolls later. And her sister is the last person she thinks of when she really and truly thinks that she is about to die. I think that that's just so heartwarming and really reflects on. Yeah, I know what you're about I to think say. That's foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> that scares me. I love the way that Rebecca Yaros describes Andarna when we first meet her because I only picture Toothless from How to Train Your Dragon, just like a golden one, especially when Violet looks back and she's like, she's like something about claws, or should I say, pause and like I just imagine like Andarna with this little like, doot, 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 like little feet and at one point she says like um uh, Andarna like twists her head but like at this like almost impossible angle I I truly only see toothless the fact that we both have stuffed toothlesses just makes me so much more connected to Andarna just because I only picture the personality of toothless and, and and on that same note like you and I both think of Andarna as like stuffed animal kind of like like this like cartoon-ish snuggle buggy and then I think of Taryn as like Drogon you know from yeah. Game of Thrones like this gigantic big scary dragon and it's like huh those aesthetics do not match up but I don't care that's why I think about like if slash when this gets adapted into a tv show I so hope HBO does it because like, man, have they done dragons right? They didn't do a lot of Game of Thrones right, but they did dragons right. We need to point out that Violet holds her own against three men. Like, go girl. Right? She knows exactly where to strike for the jack attack. She is small and weak and mighty for the win. She flexes how she's used to pain. I love that. I love that too. And then Jack fucking runs like of course jack barlow runs what a coward. coward and then she's like cracking jokes as she fights against two grown warrior trained men insulting their insults what a baddie and and then when she thinks that she's about to die she's just happy that she made jack run away like what a what a good last thought that is for her like she just accepts it like a champ and she, we just got to give her those props because wow she deserves them i love that like as she's fighting these guys she's like back at andarna you can go anytime now <laughs> like you can fly at any time i love that one of my favorite zayden lines of the entire book is no but i can narrate <laughs> all right i think we're gonna have this as a section of every single podcast and that is favorite tarn lines you're bleeding stop it <laughs> we said that earlier but i just it's worth mentioning again your hands are bound too do you bleed often <laughs> and then violet comes back with I try not to. <laughs> like, and then, of course, pronunciation could use some work. God, our favorite commotion of a dragon is just coming in hot. Favorite violet lines are, this is speaking to Taryn, get on your back, I repeat like a fucking parrot. <laughs> and then finally, she says to Taryn, I didn't think I'd make it this far. And as much as she believes in herself, as much as she says the mantra, I will not die today, she is so focused on the journey of not dying every single day that she doesn't think about the destination. This is one instance where it is the destination and the journey, but also the destination. Wow. We did it. We did it. Episode Ooh, that... three. So if you are not already, please give us a follow on Instagram and TikTok at Fantasy Fangirls Pod. It means so much to us when you are tagging us. You're, you're using our audio in some of your TikToks. Just absolutely love it. Thank you so much. We love it when you guys tag us in other videos that are theories. So please keep that coming. It's so fun. Also, do not forget to rate and review the show. We found out this morning, we're recording this on Friday the 15th. We found out this morning that we are ranked number six in our category on Spotify, which is 
crazy. <laughs> I even was like, Nicole, when do we stop calling ourselves a baby pod? Like we are I know, still normally a baby I'm, pod, but <laughs> like I, I said, in our, I say in our notes, like we're a baby podcast, but it's like, I don't think we can say we're a baby podcast anymore when we've been ranked number six in our category. Please keep the rating and reviews coming. They help so much with other people finding the show. They also make me absolutely openly weep when I read them in the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who's written a review on Apple Podcasts. We cannot even describe to you how much it means to us. But most importantly, share this with your fellow fourth wing friends, your book clubs, your friend who's currently reading fourth wing, dangle this like a carrot in front of them so that they can finish reading faster so you can talk to them about it. Please share this with your friends who are fourth wing fans. It really means so much to us. So next Monday, we will be dropping episode four, which will be covering chapters 16 through 20. We know some of you guys are rereading the chapters with us that you can listen to the pod right after reading the group of chapters that we're on. So we're covering 16 through 20 on next episode. We'll see you there.